like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the uh, last of our series for 2020 for on healthy longevity at the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine at National University of Singapore. Uh, don't worry, we'll be back in 2021. I'll talk about that at the end. Uh, this is very exciting. Today we have Beatrix Vreiken giving us a talk on exercise. Uh, and I think we could all use to hear that. Uh, the other interesting thing is that unlike most shows where I'm asking somebody else to get up at three in the morning. This time I'm getting up at three in the morning. So if my questions are even less coherent than usual, then you'll know why. Um, please use the Q&A chat button when you're asking questions and Shermaine will uh, collate those questions and ask them for you later. Uh, and before we start with Beatrix, uh, we're going to hear from a senior uh, in Singapore, uh, Mr. Gopal Kanapati, who's 75 years old. He's a volunteer with the Age Well Everyday program that's being run by the Mind Science Center at NUS Medicine. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Gopal Kanapati. Uh, I'm uh, 75 years old. I think it is in these four aspects. Healthy aging is a, is a journey whereby we have to op optimize opportunities available for a healthy lifestyle and also to enhance our life throughout the age. That's point one. The second point I would say is in healthy lifestyle, maintaining a positive well-being, good health, physical, mental, both together as we age. On point three, it's managing the thing. Healthy life is managing the functional ability of both physical and mental capacity, which allows you to do, to value to what you do. And of course, last but not least, healthy aging helps to build a society that is cohesive, harmonious, peaceful, and safe. That's how I see healthy aging is. Yes, I have concern because my main concern is my aging is lifelong learning. Because I, during my experience 
with the seniors, I find that there's a lack of it. Uh, growth and uh, learning doesn't cease as we age, you know, it's ongoing. So my concern is that uh, seniors, especially at this current year, current, I should say, not current age or current, but the current time, they must learn. They must be, they must be educated to understand that what's going around. And now, you know, we are, the life is changing. Now we are moving to more like a digital and IT kind of. My COVID-19 was an example. Seniors, they have the phone, yes. Very basic, 4G, 3G, some Android. Some, they have iPhone. Only use it for calling, SMS, WhatsApp. Other than that, they don't know what to do. Lack of IT knowledge, lack of digitalization. So they put them at the back seat of technology and growth. Growing older is uh, part of a normal life. Uh, to stay healthy, we must practice healthy habit and healthy lifestyle. Uh, make a healthy lifestyle your choice. That's best number one, I think. Number two is eat a, ba eat a, eat, eat a balanced diet. Healthy and nutritious. Yeah. Make sure you sleep well, have proper sleep. Number four, I say is this is for those who are taking alcohol and smoking. Try to moderate, if not, give up totally. Stay active as possible as you can, not off and on as you like, but every day. Keep your mind active always. One practice is mindfulness. If you can practice mindfulness, it is very good to keep your mind calm and cool. Then one of the final tips is to say, do not miss your doctor's appointment. Visit doctor regularly or as and when is the point. Okay, now for the main event. Uh, Beatrix's title is Become Active, Stay Healthy, A Pathway to Lasting Change. She is a professor at the Department of Neuromedicine and Movement Science at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at Norwegian University of Science and Technology. She's one of the experts on not only getting people to exercise, but helping them continue to exercise in a sustainable and healthy way. So I'm really excited to hear your talk, uh, Beatrix. Uh, you're on. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure uh, to be here today with you, uh, all of you, and contribute to this wonderful uh, webinar series. So let me share my screen so you can see my presentation. So uh, Brian already told you about the title. So I wanna talk a little bit more about how, help, how to help other people to be active or to become active if they're not active from before. So this whole entire webinar series is about healthy aging and longevity. And that's actually quite complicated process. So there are many factors that we know uh, influence these uh, processes. Some of them are generic, so they apply to uh, everyone. Many others though are individual, at least partly individual. Some of these uh, factors that are, uh, are influencing healthy aging and longevity are modifiable. So there's something that we can do about. 
Uh, other factors may be less easy uh, to change. To make it even more complicated, most of these factors interact. So they're not simply additive or canceling each other out. They may uh, interact and change each other's uh, effect on healthy aging longevity. So this is just a very quick intro introduction to showing how complex this process is. And in my presentation today, I don't want to try to cover a lot of these factors. What I would rather do is focus on one factor in particular, which is physical activity. So that's what my talk is going to focus on today. So very briefly first, what is physical activity? Well, it's defined as any body movement produced by our muscles that requires energy above resting level. This is not necessarily the same as exercise. So exercise, we often think about going to the gym. Uh, it's planned, structured, often repetitive. Uh, but physical activity is much wider. So it includes exercise and sports, but it can also include dancing, gardening, walking, household uh, chores, and especially if you're getting older, some of these activities are, you can actually count as being exercise. So we're talking about that entire uh, complexity of uh, physical activity, anything that makes you move your body. And most of us, and hopefully all of us, know that physical activity is important. It's important in general for, because it contributes to a healthy body and mind. It also contributes to the prevention of many health problems and diseases, such as, for example, many different types of cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases. And it's therefore a very important contributing factor uh, to successful aging. This is general physical activity. We also have specific physical activity and training, which, is all, which can also be very important in certain situations. First of all, it makes us good at something. Practice makes perfect, they say. It also contributes to regaining function after you had an injury. And it contributes to rehabilitation after illness. So many of the rehabilitation processes in, uh, include you doing something with your body, doing some sort of exercise or physical activity. We all know this. Unfortunately, most of us, including me, <laughs> are not active enough. And the World Health Organization just came with new recommendations um, on physical activity guidelines. And they uh, upped the numbers a little bit from previous guidelines. So now they recommend that you are at least active two and a half to five hours a week in moderate um, uh, physical activity. And that can just be walking or swimming or going around the house uh, cleaning, for example. Or... Uh, 75 to 150 minutes with high intensity uh, walking um, activity. So something that is really getting your um, breath up and maybe you start sweating. It can also be a combination of these things. In addition, they also rec uh, recommend that you do some muscle strengthening activities at least twice weekly, and that you reduce the amount of uh, sitting still or lying on the couch as much as possible. We know this, we know, most of us know that we should be more active than we are. Uh, but too many uh, adults do not manage to fulfill not even the old guidelines and they were about half of what they recommend now. So if we are going to look at the new numbers of how many adults actually manage to uh, follow these guidelines, it may not be many of us. Unfortunately, activity levels further tend to further decline with increasing age. And this is not very promising for a healthy and active old age. We're also often not active enough in rehabilitation when we're actually a patient and we have everything to gain immediately from uh, following the recommendations, for example, from your physiotherapist. Because also here, the more training, the better the results. And uh, most of the evidence shows that there is a dose response relationship. So the more you train and follow the recommendations, the more results you actually achieve and the quicker you achieve uh, these results. Unfortunately, in most countries, even in Norway, which is a rather rich country, we don't have the resources, so either the, the money or the personnel, to have close personal follow-up by health personnel of all uh, patients. And many do not manage on their own. So even if you have an appointment once a week and your physiotherapist tells you what to do daily or maybe even three times a day, no matter how simple some of these exercises may be, many of us look like, oh, I'll do it later, I'll, I'll do more tomorrow, or maybe I'll catch up next week. 
Uh, there's lots of excuses and sometimes very good reasons, but many of us have problems following these uh, physiotherapy um, instructions. Um, so this is not very promising for healthy, active old age either. So how can we go from this where uh, people walk, walk <laughs> the dog uh, from the car or where they even take an escalator uh, on the way to the gym? I mean, there's something so wrong with that picture. If you're going to the gym to exercise, at least take the stairs. So how do you go from those kind of images to this one? This one is uh, an example from a really nice initiative a couple of years ago in Stockholm, where they made a staircase not only look like a piano, but it also sounded like a piano. So depending on which uh, step you were taking, you got the right sound. And as you can see in this image, people uh, really started to use the stair because it was fun. It was much more fun than go riding the escalator. So how can we do this? How can we increase activity levels? Well, I'm going to try to give you two answers to that one. They're not the only answers possible, but I'm just going to focus on two. And the first one is that we can make exercise more fun and by turning it into a game, for example. Those two examples, I think probably most of you have at least heard about and maybe even played uh, Wii Sports and Pokemon Go. They really managed to get a lot of people up from the couch and use their body. So these kind of exer games or uh, exercise games or exer games as we call them for short, they can help provide general training to increase physical activity level. They can offer specific exercises as part of a rehabilitation program. They give you uh, personalized instructions and feedback. It can also increase motivation and adherence by making uh, your exercises more fun. It can make you actually forget that you're exercising. Everybody who ever played a computer game, whether it was just a silly game only using your fingers or whether it was an actual exercise game. Sometimes you get really hooked. You completely forgot like, oh, I'm doing this already for half an hour or an hour and a half. If we can do that into our exercise, we might get some headways there. This would also enable people to train with instructions and with feedback away from the, uh, the clinic or the training center. So without having this person uh, next to you. It could also increase social activity if you play together. The problem is that originally all these games were meant for entertainment and they were mostly targeting young people uh, exit gaming. What about using this for older people? Would that really work? Can we do that? Well, the evidence so far suggests that at least in the kind of countries where I live and work, older people like it too. They like, they like the games for the same reasons that most other people do. Uh, they think it's fun, they can do it together with their grandchildren or with uh, the personnel in their uh, care home. They can do it together, they can work together or compete against each other. They think it's fun as well. So that's promising. But they do have different needs. We cannot just simply take an exit game that was, for me, <laughs> looks like it was uh, developed for ADHD, uh, young people just jumping around and spinning and things on the screen are happening way too fast. There's too much noise. Those kind of games are probably not really what all the people want. So we have an entire um, research program going on at our university um, about developing and using serious games for older people. Uh, we also call this gamification so that you take something that in, uh, in essence is a serious thing like uh, rehabilitation training but you gamify it. So you use the principles from uh, game technology to make it more fun and help people do the right things and do that often enough. So the first uh, part of this talk, uh, I'm gonna uh, say a little bit more about this research area called EXACT, Exagaming for Active Healthy Aging and Rehabilitation. Uh, it started quite modest a couple of years ago uh, but it's really grown because there's so much interest uh, in this area and there's more and more people who want to um, be part of this group. So by now we are really um, a very, um, how do you call it, cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary research group. We have people from human movement science, which is my own background. We have uh, health science people, computer scientists, developers, et cetera, et cetera. And quite a large number of PhD projects, uh, postdocs, and a lot of sub-projects. 
I won't be able to really uh, present a lot of it, but I want you to give you a flavor of the kind of things that we are looking at and the kind of uh, results that we are getting. So the main goal of EXACT is to establish exergaming as a comprehensive training and rehabilitation technology for older adults so that we can help them increase their physical activity in general, prevent loss of future physical and cognitive function, and also to be able to offer specific training as part of treatment and rehabilitation after injury or disease. So the first project I want to talk a little bit about is the, was the postdoc project of Atar Nawaz, who really focused on what older people themselves want. So he did a lot of usability studies, interviews uh, with older adults. And in terms of the design of the technology, the answers were pretty clear. They want a simple and quiet design, no need for fancy graphics, not things that fly around on the screen and a lot of disturbing noises, just something that's a little bit more pleasant to the eye and the ear. They definitely want an intuitive user interface that's easy to use. It should be plug and play uh, for these people to really uh, be willing to make the efforts. There should not be like half an hour installation guide uh, about how to get started. And also the, the, the essence of the game and the kind of activities that they should be doing should somehow be meaningful to them. So we need to map what we as, uh, as scientists know they should be doing on the kind of things that we can build into these uh, games so that they actually do the kind of things that are good for them. Then in terms of uh, what should happen over time, first of all, they really appreciate the automatic adjustment in difficulty level. So if, for example, you're getting up at 2.30 in the morning, like some of us today, <laughs> and want to play an exit game, then maybe you're not in your uh, best uh, uh, form. So then the, the, the game should pick up on that and just make life for Brian <laughs> a little bit easier. But if you have been running around uh, already that day and you come and you start the game and you're really fit for fight and everything is just flowing like a dream today, then you want maybe the game to automatically pick up on that too and just make it a little bit harder for you, just to challenge you a little bit more. But it should be automatic. It should not just be up to the user, the player, to decide, oh, today I'm in a lousy form or today I'm perfect. It should be uh, picked up by the game. And that's possible, that's not a problem. Many of them also liked the multiplayer option so that they can play together uh, or in competition, depending mostly if you're a woman or a man. And then preferably, and many of them also mentioned that they like these additional cognitive elements, little quizzes and underway, uh, those kind of challenges, in addition to just the pure uh, movements. And then finally, another thing to really keep in mind, many of them mentioned that this was really nice, but I tried it in your laboratory where there was a lot of space. I would not be able to do this at home. So we need to, make, we need to keep in mind that people may, even if they live big enough, they might have a lot of furniture, uh, carpets, uh, things that you need to keep in account uh, when you design these games. So one general thing is that we are trying to move away by... Uh, uh, from strictly screen-based game, games and activities so that we can also just do it anywhere and maybe outside or without having the um, uh, availability of a computer screen. So very quickly, a little bit what we know about exergaming and rehabilitation. So we know that it can improve balance confidence and reduce fear of falling. And there's some really good uh, examples of research that there is uh, positive effects of exergaming that go beyond uh, more traditional forms of balance training. Uh, we, there's lots of evidence that it's promising in the rehabilitation of stroke, survivor, so, uh, stroke survivors. So there's positive effects on hand function, balance and gait. Uh, there's very few adverse events during exergaming. But we don't always know what parts of the intervention are effective. Uh, it has been used quite a lot already with people with Parkinson's disease as well where it can help reduce motor symptoms, improve balance. But commercial games are often too challenging for this group, especially if they have more advanced forms of Parkinson. And we don't know all that much about safety in, for example, this patient group. So there, we need to know more about whether or not it's okay uh, for these games to be used independently. And then finally, we know that it can increase activity in patients with uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, but there's a large variation in patients' capacities and needs, and we know that one size does not fit all. Not all people in the same patient group, and definitely not across patients. So it needs to be personalized. 
But in order to personalize these games, we require a lot of specific knowledge. Um, so we need to know which exercise should be offered to that particular person, how they should be performed, how can we design the game so that it really triggers people to do the right movements and not some uh, poor form of it. How can you give them feedback about right and wrong performance? How can you adjust the game automatically to daily form, individual need, preferences, etc.? If you start looking into the literature uh, with these questions in mind, there's surprisingly little research that has looked into these questions. So that's one of the things that uh, one of our uh, PhD uh, projects uh, looked at. That was Nina. She started as a master student, did exegaming, then she did a PhD on exegaming, now, then she did a postdoc on exegaming, and by now she's her own um, research um, associate and still uh, working in this area. So some of the main results from her uh, many years of uh, work in this area. Uh, the games are indeed fun for older adults as well, but we don't know much about how long they stay fun and whether the game, uh, what we can do with the game to make sure that it stays fun. Then game characteristics affect game movements. Uh, we saw that very clearly, but that means that you need to choose and design your game very carefully and not just pick one from what happens to be available. People also very quickly learn what will give them points and that you can, you can use that to uh, make sure that you actually elicit the right activity and movements from the participants or the gamers. And then finally, we need focus on adherence, that people actually keep doing this and long-term follow-up. We need to ensure player safety during unsupervised exergaming, and we need to personalize the games to goals and functional levels. The next question is really, is exergaming strictly physical? It's an exercise game, but does that mean that it's only uh, addressing fun um, physical functions? We know that there are changes in both physical and cognitive function with age. Many serious games for elderly include cognitive elements because people find that more fun. But we don't really know how this affects movements while people are playing. So what happens in the brain during exercise gaming? And this is uh, an ongoing uh, PhD project from uh, Philip Anders, who has looked into this. So the first question we wanted to know is, can we actually measure brain activity while people are moving? Uh, at least until a couple of years ago, that was not possible. Can we do it now? Or are the brain, the really tiny little electrical brain signals masked by no noise and muscular activity? Also, do changes in cognitive demands lead to changes in brain activity? Or is an exergame cognitively demanding by default? So the first attempt that he did was really very careful and we made it as easy as possible to not overwhelm ourselves with an impossible data set. So we measured brain activity with EEG uh, during gameplay, 64 channels, which is not a lot. It was a passive system, which uh, by now has been replaced by much better systems, but at least it was portable. So we could use it uh, while people were moving around. Again, to make it easier, we started with young adults, just to make sure that we can actually use this technology while people are moving. We had a super easy uh, exit game, which was about training balance. All the people doing were uh, moving um, left to right, depending on which puzzle piece they wanted to choose. And then we analyzed the EEG, both the channels and the, the source space, so where in the brain the activity comes from. Despite all these really simple choices, we got some really exciting results. So first of all, which was really um, promising, it was not a big problem to remove artifacts in the EEG signal so that you, what, you get rid of all the noise and all you have left is the, the, the actual brain activity. That was possible uh, without big problems. Um, so we can measure EEG uh, during exergaming. And what we saw, which I didn't find surprising, but uh, apparently the people in the field found it surprising because there was no problem getting it uh, published, is that just uh, comparing moving left to right with the same movement but in a game requires much more cognitive attention and cognitive resources. So an exit game is inherently already having cognitive um, challenges. So we are uh, running now a similar experiment where we also add uh, look uh, in a group of older adults 
and we're using a far less simple game, so a more realistic game where people move um, more in 3D. And we're in the process of analyzing these data. So let me move on to the second part of um, the things that I want to talk about today. Uh, with, that is a different way of increasing activity on your levels. And that's by making exercise hidden and integrated into daily life. This is referring to um, an EU project that we just uh, finished uh, last year uh, called Prevent It, which was about early risk detection and prevention of functional decline in younger adults. And the main goal of this project was to uh, develop uh, a mobile health system for younger, older adults, so people just past uh, retirement age, so that we could engage them, increase their physical activity levels while they were still well functioning, so before they got problems, uh, prevent um, retirement-related drop in activity level that we very often see, at least in the Western world, when people retire, and enable a lasting behavioral change towards an active lifestyle. This is a busy graph. I won't go uh, into detail into it, but it, these, it shows the different phases that we had in the Prevented project, where in the first phase, we developed all the tools that we needed, including an app uh, and self-tests and um, all the other technology. Then we tried the app um, and uh, analyzed the results. So the most important part for today's presentation is the focus that Prevented had on integrating functional exercises in daily life. So rather than telling people to go to the gym a couple of times a week, we try to find clever ways of just doing a little bit of exercise while you're going around your uh, normal daily business. This is not a concept that we invented. It was uh, developed by Lindy Clemson um, several years ago in Australia. And it's called LIFE, so Life Integrated Functional Exercises. The reason we couldn't just use it as it was uh, is what, that it was developed for people that were slightly older, so 75 plus. So we adapted it. We uh, added um, activities. We made the activities more challenging. We had a wider range in difficulty levels so that people could um, uh, progress more. And we added uh, motivational strategies and really mapped uh, are things on behavioral change techniques uh, to increase the chances that this would actually lead to a, uh, a different lifestyle. And then we implemented that on a, a mobile phone. As I said, we had a clear focus on behavioral change. So we, uh, on the phone, people got uh, to choose their own long-term goals. So what they could choose what was important for them. Uh, we gave them daily reminders, advices about what they could be doing if they wanted to reach their own goal, and gave them uh, many different motivational messages uh, throughout uh, the, the period. This is a quick graph about the entire flow uh, through the uh, experiment. Most importantly, we recruited 180 people uh, between the ages of 61 and 70, and we had a six-month active intervention where people were using the app uh, and could get uh, support from us, followed by a six-month non-active follow-up. So they could still use the app if they wanted to, but we didn't send any more messages. Uh, we didn't um, interfere with their daily life. And we did this across three different sites. And then very quick, some of the highlights of the results that we found. So we had actually pretty good compliance and adherence. So people were actually using the system, they were uh, doing their exercises. Um, it was acceptable to them, even though our technology and our app was very premature. They had no problems uh, using the technology, um, of course, in the three countries in which we ran this, which may not be uh, completely uh, representative for the entire world. Uh, we didn't have any serious adverse events, so doing slightly more complicated things in daily life did not seem to present uh, big problems. The interesting thing is that all our groups improved over time. So both the control group who only got advice to um, become more active and the people uh, getting this uh, intervention, they all improved. Then from the interview, uh, we know that they, they were very positive, very impressed about the project. They were happy to have participated. Uh, they were a little bit more critical about the immature technology. So that is definitely something uh, that can be a showstopper. So the technology has to be uh, correct and right and mature. Uh, like I mentioned, many had changed the daily behavior in all three arms, just 
being part of this really managed to, motivated them to become more active. And then for many people, the activities had actually become habitual. So brushing your teeth, standing on one uh, leg, taking the stairs rather than the elevator, all of that seems to really become part of people's life. Are these changes lasting? My last slide. Well, it's a little bit too early to tell, and it's also hard to tell because it really requires that we follow up long-term all these people. But it, it is very promising that behavioral change in daily life routines, we've managed to do that, and that some of these more active uh, routines uh, became automatic in their daily life. There's also some indication that people need that support of the technology and those motivational messages and these advices, especially in the beginning to get started. And that once they are uh, going, especially if they manage to do, you know, integrate this in their daily routines, that it actually becomes quite a new uh, day, way of living. So that's really promising. The big question, of course, is how do you follow up over a long time? As a researcher, we would like to know if this is actually something that meant uh, people manage to do. Here, we think we can use uh, small wearable sensors uh, that have been developed where you can uh, monitor daily life activity in large groups of people without being very obtrusive. Um, that is actually something that we are focusing on in a new very large uh, EU project called Mobilized, where we are looking to validate um, real-world digital mobility assessments. That was pretty much what I had to say. I want to thank you for your attention. And back to you, Brian. Thanks. That's really interesting. Um, you know, I get asked uh, all the time about uh, exercise uh, by people who are trying to, you know, live longer, live healthier. And so I'm always trying to come up with answers for them. So, you know, this is very helpful. I think that, you know, one of the, one of the questions I would have off the top is, how do you imagine getting this mainstream? I mean, it, I think clearly, you know, these extra games are, are, are showing value and people are motivated to do them. Uh, but it seems like you almost have to bring in the private sector to really, you know, develop the technology in a way that it can go mainstream and, and develop widespread and sustained use. Uh, what do you think? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is one way to go, but that's not, um, not an easy way to go and also maybe not a very quick way to go. Another thing that we are trying here in Norway, and I think in England, uh, they are doing that as well, is where you find ambassadors. So you find uh, people in the community that would be the target group that have the wherewithal and the interest and the motivation and the capacity to learn to do this and then become an ambassador for other people who then become ambassador for other people. So you get the snowball effect where you maybe start with one group of 20 older adults, but they go out and find another 20 older adults within their friends. Um, yeah, and I think that's probably uh, a much better way to go. And we need to shout about this. We need to uh, make sure that not just published in um, scientific journals, but that we um, disseminate it as widely as possible also in popular journals and in in, in other, all countries, not just what we usually focus on in, uh, in the Western world. What about what is happening in Norway with exercise? Is it uh, doing well compared to other countries? Or I would imagine it is. Uh, but I, I, I envision you out cross country skiing like three or four times a week right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have no snow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Norway is. Uh, Right now, it's still uh, on uh, average, it's quite active. So a lot of people go out. Uh, when we do go out uh, walking or running or hiking or skiing, we see a lot of older people uh, doing the same thing. We see a lot of young people and children on their own doing the same thing. And that, I think, is something that is um, better than in many other countries, especially Western countries. Uh, what is worrying is that also here, we see, for example, obesity numbers going up, uh, children also being more interested in computer screens. Um, so we might get the same trend here. Maybe we're just 15, 20 years later behind other Western countries. And then hopefully we can learn something from countries where it went really wrong. People became very, very uh, passive. I mean, like the U.S.? I didn't want to say that, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> like the U.S. <laughs> also in the U.S., you would never, well, in most places, I, the places that I know in the U.S., which of course not everywhere, but 
people don't even let their children out on the street and definitely not unsupervised. Uh, they don't feel it's safe. It's not an issue in Norway. So if kids want to be more active than the parents, no problem. Yeah. They just go outside and play. That's my sense in Norway and in Scandinavia is like, if you go to the parks, they're crowded, you know, people are out walking, they're out doing things. Yeah, but I want are. to come back to another distinction that you made is that between physical activity and exercise, because I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And I use the example of Japan in that regard, because older people in Japan are physically active. You know, you see these uh, older women walking to the grocery, carrying their groceries back every day. It's, it's part of their everyday life. And, and I think that Western countries have have lost that mindset. You know, we drive to the grocery store and buy a month's worth of food, and and you know, the, at most we carry it in the house. That's all of our exercise. So, um, you know, I think one thing is how do you encourage that sort of normal physical activity in people's lives? You were touching on that in some of the programs at the end, mm -hmm. but it, uh, it seems like that's so important. Um, I, I totally agree. And um, I think it is important that uh, when you walk into a hotel, well, maybe a hotel is not the best example, but any uh, public building, the easy thing to find would be the stair. And the difficult thing to find would be the elevator rather than the elevator being right in your nose when you enter a building. And you have to really find, try hard to find the stairs. And maybe sometimes the stairs are not even meant for the public to be used. Mm -hmm. And some simple examples of putting a little sign on the elevator saying free exercise to the right and that of course would be where the stairs are and I think a lot of people don't realize that if especially if you're an older person anything that you do that gets you up from the couch and from a comfortable chair is physical activity uh, doing your own groceries walking to the grocery walking the stairs as long as you can all of that helps and it's definitely better than driving everywhere, uh, getting other people to do uh, your groceries, taking the elevator all the time. So as long as you can, I tell my parents, just don't move to a new building with an elevator. Try to use the stairs that you have in the house as long as possible. It will help you train your muscles, your bone density, and it's free exercise. You can do that as many times a day as you, as you manage. So let's talk about a little bit more in, in detail about levels of exercise. Like how much is enough? You know, the people ask me this all the time and their programs like the health promotion board here, which tries to get you to take extra steps. Um, is it a graded response is a little bit good and a little bit more better and a little bit more better. Or is there some threat? I mean, this takes someone like me, not someone who's in rehabilitation. So someone in their fifties, um, what what's the data suggest uh, do i need to hit some threshold to get the benefit do i have to hit the who guidelines do i need to do twice that i mean where, where does the yeah. real health span effect come from the there is this uh, graded response so up to a certain uh, level a, a little bit more is a little bit better uh there is for most people there is a maximum so you cannot just go running several hours a day uh, without maybe getting problems with your knees or your back or uh, so there seems to be this sort of a bell curve uh, where there is a sort of an optimum but the optimum i think most people their own bodies will warn them when they get close to that optimum and when they start to get over it uh, until there uh, everything that you do is helping so if somebody is really sedentary just getting up from the couch and take a stair, for example, or just start walking for 10 minutes is already better than just staying on the couch. And I think that message is a little bit lost when you see the um, uh, only the big headlines. You have to be active five hours a week. If you think that that's going to be difficult and you think like, okay, then I'm just not gonna bother. That's really a pity because two minutes activity each day is better than nothing. And of course the, the, the health guidelines say that if you manage to do a lot more and if you manage to follow the guidelines, that is better. It's not necessarily optimal. I think for some people it can be less than that and for some people it can be more than that. But I don't think people should stop by that big sign that, oh, I have to be active at least an hour a day. I don't know where to find that hour. If you could just read a book while walking around, for example, or again, just take the stairs or brush your teeth standing on one leg, you practice your balance. It doesn't cost extra time. I don't know about reading a book, walking around. I see people watching their, looking at their cell phones, walking around and I, I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah, maybe that was not a good example. 
couple of them have almost killed me trying to run. So it's, uh, yeah, maybe that's not a good idea. <laughs> uh, you, you I mentioned... had this really boring stepping uh, machine that I used maybe for a week and a half. And it was incredibly boring. You stood on it and you just went like this. And then I read a book because that was just way too boring to do it on its own. Yeah, I have a problem with that too. I run outside, but when I try to run on treadmills, it, it's just so boring. I can barely. Yeah. Yeah. No, but, I agree. You know, outside in outside in Singapore has the reverse problem of outside in Norway because it's like running in a sauna in Singapore. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but I still do it. It's uh, you get used to it. Um, yeah. You mentioned the complexity between um, exercise and other uh, things that factor into aging. Um, a diet would be one that comes to mind. Nutrition. Um, how 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 do you see that? I mean, you know, we talk about what a healthy diet is, but that's probably different depending on your levels of exercise. Um, I don't know if you've done research on this directly, but I'm sure you get asked this question: Is there a different diet that's healthy for someone who's active versus someone who's sedentary? Probably. I mean, the level of calories would definitely be different. Uh, what you need to be able to lie on a couch versus uh, to go running or hiking or skiing or even just walk to the grocery. You need more um, uh, sustenance. Um, but there's an, in I, I haven't studied this myself, but there was an interesting study by a colleague of mine uh, where they ask, this is not older people, but just people in general, they ask them, um, to start exercising and they and then they got free access to the, the the lunch buffet in the cantina and they followed and so they monitored exactly what people were eating and they could choose freely and what they saw in the beginning was uh, an increase in what people eat so both the amount and uh, the amount of calories to say it's simple um, but it leveled off and there was a, a, a positive effect that uh, the increase in calories was less than the increase in the need for sustenance. So people do tend uh, naturally to eat a little bit more if they are more active, but less so than, um, uh, than what you actually need. And the interesting thing was also that people who are sedentary uh, in that um, uh, study, they had not, they didn't have this uh, they didn't demonstrate a good feeling of what their body needed and how much they needed. So they were eating different things in different amounts than the people that uh, were exercising. And the people that were exercising were actually naturally geared towards what was better for them. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, I tend to believe that if you're doing heavy exercise, that your body is better at telling you what you should be eating. You, you're craving yeah. change. And yeah. I, I don't know any data on that, but it just feels like no. that. Um, I think it's the other way around that uh, you lose that that natural sense when you're sedentary. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah. I, I would agree. Uh, you know, you mentioned yeah, doing the me measuring uh, brain function during exercise, and uh, you were looking at activity. Uh, one of the things that I feel like I get from exercise is that it's kind of a mindfulness thing for me. It, you know, when I'm on a long run, it clears my head. You know, mm -hmm. it it allows me to like put a lot of stress out of my mind. Uh, is there a way to measure that? I, because it seems like that's another way of combining the exercise mm -hmm. and the mental benefits at the same time. I think that's a great idea. Um, we probably need some imp further improvements in the technology because right now you would walk around with a, like a, a, a bathing uh, cap with all the electrodes and you would have a backpack uh, with uh, the battery and everything. I don't see you really getting very mindfulness, <laughs> very mindful. <Yeah. laughs> you walk around looking like a very strange person. But I think an interesting study, what you probably could do more easily is, for example, measure your resting state brain activities and what parts of the brain are active, then send you on a long hike, ask you to come back when you feel really relaxed and refreshed and your brain is all um, yeah, set to go again, and then measure uh, your resting state again. Uh, that might actually be possible to uh, see if different parts of the brain are different, uh, uh, differently active. Uh, so whether the activity changes, so it changes where it's active. Maybe that whole frontal um, activity where the cognition is and the executive function, everything, maybe that quiets down. I don't know. It's a, it's a great hypothesis. That would be fun, I think, to, uh, to investigate.
Well, I can volunteer if you like. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just need to send you a ticket, right, to Norway. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm ready to come anytime. I, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the lack of travel is starting to drive me crazy. Um, yeah. Uh, let's bring in Charmaine, uh, and uh, uh, she's going to ask you some more questions. But before she does that, this is her last show. We're going to rotate to another person in my lab next month. And so uh, I want her to tell us for just about 30 seconds or a little more of what, what she's doing with her project. Hi, Brian. Hi, Prof. Prof. Beatrix. <laughs> Thanks for the lovely talk. Um, so yeah, okay, I'm gonna just quickly explain my project first before I get into the questions from the viewers. Um, so I've, my project is basically investigating the effects of certain FDA approved drugs, for example, fibrates on the aging process. And through the course of my study, I actually use both in vitro models as well as different model organisms, um, such as the tiny worm C. elegans. Um, so hopefully through this project, we'll be able to find compounds that are actually useful in promoting healthy lifespan. And also perhaps it can give us further insights into the aging process. So yeah, <laughs> that's it. Um, maybe I'll go into questions, Prof. Beatrix, because there's quite a number today. Um, so this one is from Richard, and he wants to know, um, you, mentioned some, you mentioned a little bit about cognitive function in your studies. Um, so he's interested to know that frailty is actually closely related to cognitive decline. So do these exercise games that you talked about, do you see an improvement in cognitive function, which I think you mentioned, but for example, in early stages of dementia? Uh, that's maybe two different questions. So yes, we see uh, improvements in cognitive function uh, when people uh, start doing these games. It's the same, I think, a little bit as with uh, physical activity. A little bit is always better than a little less. And I think the same you see in cognitive function. So the more you train your brain, the more uh, responsive your brain also becomes. Whether that will safeguard you to um, dementia or can delay the onset, I think we, we don't know yet. Um, I think you'll get the Nobel Prize if you really manage to uh, prevent or delay uh, the onset of dementia. But it's a really important question and an important problem in our, in our world. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think another question that keeps on reoccurring among a lot of our viewers is the kind of exercise. Um, so this is from uh, David, and he wants to actually know, with regards to exercise, which do you think is better for the elderly, um, aerobic or anaerobic exercise, or a little bit of a combination of both is actually better? The, the evidence so far suggests that uh, just being physical active in general, uh, a little bit regardless almost of what you're doing, is definitely good. So even if it's just walking, uh, the more people, or not the more people walk, but just adding some walking and that kind of uh, low level activity is, is actually helpful. Then for older adults in particular, uh, usually it's also good to uh, focus a little bit on balance uh, so that you maintain your balance. Uh, stand a little bit on one leg, um, uh, challenge uh, your balance boundaries, just to make sure that you can still recover if you lose balance, etc. And then as I presented in the, the new World Health Organization guidelines, there's more focus now on strength exercises so that uh, people uh, should also focus a little bit on keeping their muscle strength up as much as possible. Um, aerobic exercise, it, it's, it's useful. Um, I, as far as I know, the evidence for that being better uh, or could replace any of the other ones is not very strong. So I would recommend people just do physical activity that they like to do. I think doing something that you like to do and thereby actually do it is much better than finding the perfect exercise and don't do it because you don't like it. Uh, but try to combine it with a little bit of balance uh, challenges and some strength exercises. And especially for older people, older, older people, <laughs> walking both up and down is a really great strength exercise. It doesn't have to become more complicated than that. Or just squatting instead of when you need to pick something up from the floor rather than bending uh, over. And it can be, as, it, it really can be as simple as that. Yeah. So the, there's no need to make things complicated, basically. 
No. Uh, okay, so um, this is from Ka Chan Wan, and he's interested to know, um, will Exa games prevent sarcopenia in older people? Have you seen like prevention, um, any results for prevention? Uh, we know from uh, the research that uh, strength exercises uh, really uh, build strength and maintain strength. Uh, and a lot of the uh, muscle loss that we see, the, the, what we think is normal muscle loss with age, doesn't have to happen. Whether you can really prevent sarcopenia in the end, I don't know, uh, because that's a, a medical state. But you can definitely maintain a lot more of your muscle strength that you are used to from younger ages than what we always thought. We thought it would be normal to lose up to 60% of your uh, muscle strength. That doesn't have to happen. So, and there's many anecdotal examples of uh, older people who keep doing gymnastics, for example. Um, they are almost as strong as they used to be. They don't lose a lot of their muscle strength, but you need, you need to make an effort. <laughs> it, it doesn't come by just telling your muscles that they need to stay. <laughs> Okay, so this one is from Jonathan, and it's a bit more about application of the exergaming. So he's curious to know, do you have any solutions that um, you thought of or your team thought of that might circumvent the use of screens for exergaming? Because you know, exergaming, they're looking a lot at screens and that might not yeah. be good for them as well. Uh, that's one of the things that we're looking into now is where we uh, try to gamify the environment. And for example, uh, there's uh, some really nice projects going on. Uh, for example, in Denmark, where uh, they're uh, in the parks, they have sort of a running light and it's a little bit like Chase the Rabbit. So you can just follow the light and they make an, an entire parkour uh, through a park. Uh, you can um, change the environment uh, so that people have to go up and down and maybe challenge the balance a little bit. Uh, so you can gamify things in that way. So make whatever you do a little bit more fun and a little bit less expected, like the piano uh, stairs. Uh, you don't need a computer screen for that at all. And I think that is really the way to go. And then there's uh, apps that you don't have to look at the screen. You just have your earplugs in and it tells you, oh, run now or uh, do um, uh, some skipping or stand on one. So there's a lot of things that can be done uh, that moves you away from the screen. and. I don't know, this year has been really tiring on the eyes, I think, with uh, all online meetings. And the last thing I want to do at, <laughs> during my normal day in the evening is look at my mobile phone. It's just not happening. <laughs> I've sat in front of a screen. It's all, it feels like 24 seven. And then having to look at the screen also, whether it's a big computer screen or a TV screen or a little mobile screen, just to exercise, I would rather just go outside and walk. But you can have apps uh, that, that help you uh, exercise outside. Um, so I think the, the screen, I think it's on its way out. It may still be there for very specific rehabilitation programs because you might have to demonstrate uh, for the patients what uh, the proper exercise execution would be. But other than that, just to get people more active, you, don't need a, you, you preferably don't need a TV for that. Maybe I can jump in here because we're running out of time. Uh, thank you, Beatrix. That was wonderful. Um, thanks, Germain. Uh, we're going to bring you back in the future because you're just too good at this. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, I have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, one is that the chat room will be open after this is finished if you have further questions and want to have discussion. Secondly, uh, please register again for the series next year. It's going to be very exciting in January. We're going to be talking about aging biomarkers, and we have a great lineup, uh, Steve Horvath, Morgan Levine, um, Jackie Hahn, Alex Javrenkov, so all the luminaries in the field will be talking about that. And we're also going to have a new feature uh, at the beginning of the show uh, next year, and I'm not going to tell you what that is yet. I'll just tell you that everybody in my lab is really nervous about it, so uh, that'll be a clue. Uh, and then on that note, I want to uh, do two things. Wish everyone a happy uh, holiday season and a happy new year and please come back after the year starts and secondly I want to uh, close with a video uh, on aging and we chose one from Jane Fonda this time because she's clearly doing something right uh, thanks you thank you for joining the show thanks Beatrix and I'll see you next year
As I was approaching my late 40s, when I would wake up in the morning, my first six thoughts would all be negative. And I got scared. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to become a crotchety old lady. But now that I am actually smack dab in the middle of my own third act, I realize I've never been happier. I have such a powerful feeling of well-being. And I've discovered that when you're inside oldness, as opposed to looking at it from the outside, fear subsides. You realize you're still yourself, maybe even more so. I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it. And nothing in the universe can take this I can see it clearly now Nothing gonna bring me down 